Also by the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm in Martinsburg. Get more with Mansion Ferretti, WVJusticeLawyers.com. As we say good morning to our co-hosts on this Monday morning, the admirable Stubblefield two-star. Good morning, Rob. It's great to be here as always. Wonderful to have you, Especially Bill. Especially with John Gilstrap here to keep us in tow. Keep us in line, brother. Keep us somewhere. Keep us looking up because that. <laughs> yes, he, he comes in and shifts all the chairs around. Be sure that you and I have the lowest chair do. and he has the highest chair. <laughs> you can't tell because, you know, the, on, on the camera, everything yeah. looks level. But in studio, Gilstrap's like six feet above us with and, his chair and the platform he's got himself set up on. And the crick in my neck gets worse every time <laughs> looking up at him. <laughs> Good morning, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. How are you? Good morning. I can finally see you. <laughs> That's, <it's laughs> I don't know why you want to. For, for months, all I can see is the back of your computer screen, and now I can actually see your eyes. Yeah, it, so in no time flat, you probably will want to lower that chair. Well, who knows? Go back to the obstructed view. So, you having a good morning so far, Rob? <laughs> it's been a long week. It's, a, it's, it's just so just started. I've already had the longest week in my life. It's Monday morning at 8 o'clock. And John, John and I walked in, as we generally do, about 7.30, all ready to get engaged, yeah. bubbling with them. Uh, with enthusiasm we looked at rob rob looked at him and said don't dare say a word to me i'm <laughs> i've got a miserable morning he's engaged in this email and it just looks grim <laughs> and awful and then so and then technical glitches and people who were supposed to be in studio <laughs> yeah, yeah. didn't know they were yeah. supposed to be in studio <laughs> uh, and then and then john retreated to his high chair <laughs> <laughs> I, did. I sit in my high chair that's right uh, our guest is Gary Wine. He is the Berkeley County Administrator, and he gets my award this morning for Best Guy on the Planet. Gary, good morning to you. Good, good morning, gentlemen. And I'm glad I didn't show up because I would not have had a pillow to hold me higher than John. <laughs> <laughs> You'd need a crane right now to get you up higher than Gilstrap. Oh, no, we got we got chairs here that, that will go. The, the, the seat will actually be higher than the table if, if you let the, the pneumatic thing go all the way. Yeah, the hydraulic lift. And and before Rob stole my thunder or uh, stole my fun, I was going to accuse you, Gary, of not wanting to put up with the pressure of being in studio <laughs> and taking the easy way out. But in reality, it was not you. It was our host. As time goes by, it's become much uh, apparent to me that this show is way too important to let an idiot like me be in charge of it. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we do. <laughs> we do. And yet we do. So... Uh, Gary, uh, kind enough to make up for the fact that uh, I'm a moron. Uh, Gary sent me, I sent Gary a text uh, about a week and a half ago, said, uh, I'd like to have you on the show in regards to this crowd strike thing. Uh, and then he agreed, and I said, Monday or Tuesday better? And he said, Tuesday, to which I immediately put him on the calendar as Monday, because that's what you do when someone said Tuesday is the best day for them. You put them on a different day. So we're all sitting here going, when's Gary coming in? I look at the text, it goes, Gary says, I'll be there Tuesday morning. I'm like, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Gary. Appreciate you covering for me. No problem at all. So let, let's talk uh, technical stuff. You're not just a county administrator. You're also the guy who uh, made his mark in Berkeley County with IT. Uh, before you were uh, um, promoted to that position of county administrator. And this uh, worldwide uh, shutdown of, uh, among other things, airplanes, airlines, uh, some of which are still struggling a little bit uh, getting this ready. This apparently came from a uh, software update with a bad line of code or whatever. Are we really that susceptible to something like this, Gary? Oh, my goodness. So in, in the cybersecurity cyber realm, right, so... Back years ago, everybody had antivirus, right? So you ran this software on your computer to protect you from bad files. And so then it evolved into uh, software that runs to protect you from processes called EDR, like endpoint detection and response. And that's kind of what this is. Uh, and this stuff embeds itself in your computer. And, and it literally, uh, alongside the operating system, you know, if it, if it sees something it doesn't like or a bad piece of code that's involved at the core level, it blew, it shuts it down. It stops it. Period. And that's what and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. You so stopped it. We don't use CloudStrike. I'm I'm not familiar with it at all. But uh, uh, we do we do use EDR uh, by a different company along with antivirus and then. We have, as much as these others, you have sensors on your network that do some of the same stuff that kind of look and protect. And it is, you are so vulnerable uh, to the vendors. You know, if they make a mistake, 
you clearly see what happens. I mean, we've had small instances where we get an update on one of the products and it would decide, well, it didn't like Microsoft Office that day. And all of a sudden, people's office doesn't. You're like, well, don't want it. What's going on? And sure enough, it was the stuff to protect you creating havoc in your world. Gary, was Berkeley County's computer system affected at all by the CrowdStrike issue? No, sir. It was not. Thank God. We're, uh, we plugged right along and, and uh, just hope that none of us were in airports or supermarkets, wherever it affected. It was everywhere. But no, we were not affected internally. Do you use any of CrowdStrike services? We don't. We don't. We use those products we use are from, uh, we use a Forta, Forta product called uh, their Forta EDR and antivirus. We still use a product, uh, the Symantec product that has evolved. So kind of different ones there. Gary, you've used the term EDR a couple of times. What does that mean? So endpoint detection and response. Um, historically, I mentioned earlier, you know, you had antivirus and it looked at files on your computer to protect you. Uh, EDR is more of a process oriented, so it actually looks at what's going on and pays attention. So it can it can inhibit processes, uh, actually programs from running, and not just physical files. Yeah, we cloud strike as uh, as Rob mentioned hit a lot of different sources, uh, a lot of different uh, businesses, including the airlines. I was struck by the fact though that. Most airlines came back online within a, a couple of so days. Delta did not. Do you have any idea why? What what made Delta unique? I, I do not, and I promise you <laughs> that that information won't be shared uh, for a while. Uh, who knows, Mr. Stubblefield? It could it could have been anything uh, in any way. You know the configurations and how they were leveraging it, and what what levels that they were operating with it. It, it would be a guess, and you and I both know it's you, you don't want to guess in those scenarios. Yeah, going back to the county, uh, I, I guess two questions, but the first question is uh, the county government and Board of Education, are they still, are they paired on protective mechanisms? We are not involved with the Board of Education, so I don't know. Uh, I can tell you for for us, the county commission spends a lot of effort and a lot of money to to ensure that we are as protected that that we can be. Uh, you can never spend enough, you know. It in truly, I think the the statement is it. You know, it's not if it's when you get compromised and how quick your remediation strategy and your your get back strategy, you know, is. That's that's really the big play, right? So. Uh, Thank goodness we aren't a big fish and a target. You know, you try and you don't want to make the bold statements of you're the best because none of us ever are. Uh, but you have to be prepared for when it happens because inevitably it's not just for money. I mean, they do it just to disrupt. Um, you know, you've seen, I think, recently the school district as well as Hagerstown, the county, uh, Washington County, they were compromised. Uh, very, very serious. So... Uh, it, but, it's a scary world. But for clarification, that's not the same thing we have with CloudStrike. CloudStrike was not hacking, trying to get information. No. That was just no. a, a software error. Those are ransomware yeah. in both yeah. instances. CloudStrike is an actual a piece of software that malfunctioned that caused problems. Which This John, uh, which is at I its own it. level almost more frightening. You know, no. be, be, because that, that leaves us all vulnerable. Now, in this case, it was CloudStrike, and you say you use a Symantec product. Uh, uh, program i think the one i have at home is eset as a as a um antivirus it could have been one of those right i mean there's nothing there's nothing it's just a, a bad line of code right yeah and it depends on on what you know what piece of software uh, you know you've seen now uh those particular softwares they make like a, a personal firewall that runs you know they make um you know all of them do, be it Kapersky, McAfee, it doesn't matter. They all provide this stuff. So they can malfunction in any instance, and you're like, well, I can't get on the Internet. Well, there's nothing wrong with your Internet. This stuff had an issue. Uh, but the scenario, as I understand it, with CloudStrike, you know, it was at the operating system level. So these computers were seeing, you know, the what it, in, in the IT world, the blue screen of death where the computers would not even boot. They were just non-functional. So at the private level, individual level, when something like this were to happen, what is what do we do? We don't have an IT department. <clears throat> so is a smart level just to kind of let it sit there and 
there'll be an automatic update that will take care of it? No, in this instance, as, as I understand it, they know it would take someone physically operating with it uh, to to actually bring it back to normal. It, it it wasn't waiting for an update. It wasn't functional at all. The computer just stopped thinking. So at home, uh, you would need a tech. I mean, this is one of those things, if it were to happen, that you weren't going to recover from by yourself. So this particular incident was uh, targeted toward Apple products. Uh, or the, the, the PCs. Uh, are the Apple products also vulnerable? <laughs> so you, you're right. In this instance, it was targeted toward Microsoft Windows, not Apple. Uh, yes. Anything, Bill, that, that is connected to the Internet, no matter how it's connected, is vulnerable. There's every, From your phone, whether it's an Apple and Android, to your PC, it matters not. If, if it's connected and it's taking an update from somewhere or something, then absolutely it's vulnerable. Well, you know, we, and this is what gets so scary for a Luddite like me. I, I trust that the gremlins inside the computer know what they're doing. So you get these alerts that there's an update. All I need to do is restart my computer and everything will be fine. Or the alternative is I set it to reset. It's like three in the morning and when I come in, it'll be, it'll be all fixed. So are we kind of rolling the dice every time one of these things comes through? Well, and I don't know if you're rolling the dice, but there's actually risk. I mean, if you'll remember several years ago, Apple issued an update uh, to their iPhones, you know, like, as you well know, it says, hey, your phone's got an update reboot, and all of a sudden everybody's batteries started going dead slow. Well, it was a bug in their software that was doing something that was draining the battery. So it can be as simple as that. Uh, but in, in these instances, these are third-party apps that took updates to cause problems, right? So... Um, I mean, I remember early on in the days when Microsoft was issuing updates to its Office platform, and you'd get an update, and you you just sat there and held your breath when you put your update. Well, okay, what's Word going to do now, or so on and so forth. But they they've gotten really good. There's a whole lot. I mean, there, there's an entire field involved in just testing the platform before the updates are released. So checks and balances are there. But in, in the world of of cybersecurity and this antivirus or EDR or you know the the um, in the sensors that lay on your networks that kind of protect and watch what's going on at any given time, those things could should wreak havoc, which you just saw. I was watching the History Channel the other day, and they had on the Battle of Okinawa, and it talked about how the Navy just bombarded that island for I think a month to soften it up before the troops went ashore. And I'm thinking, like the next war, Gary, the bombardment. Probably was going to be electronic, not necessarily Navy ships dropping bombs or firing, firing shells. It seems like softening up a, a nation's defense now will be more done by software than it would be anything else. Uh, from financing to power to water, everything is controlled. And in those worlds, you know, if it's connected, like I said, and, and everything is connected, right? Well, we need connectivity so we can see the. The, the, the gas transmission flow in a pipeline, or we need connectivity to monitor the electric on these lines, so on and so forth. Even though they're protected, uh, the, the connected world, and you're correct. I mean, you, you go at the finances of a country, or you go at the utilities of a country, uh, you go at the government of a country, and you, you absolutely positively can wreak havoc. Gary, we often look at something, a lesson learned from events such as this. But in this case, what happened was not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, it was a mistake. Uh, so can there be a lesson learned in this situation? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure uh, the, the processes and protocols in, in the application updates that these companies go through are unbelievably rigorous. This my this is probably and, and probably is human error somewhere right so you know the new processes with ai that that kind of help at least advise against these kinds of mistakes but uh, i don't know what you would do bill um more than they do now clearly they they will have changed some process but yeah, i think stuff like this happens all the time just not at this level are most ransomware attacks Gary, enabled because somebody opens up an email and clicks a link? Many, yes, yes. And in, in our world, in trying to protect the, our customers, the users, 
that our security folks they they cringe with it emails that are hey click here or you know just respond you know you try and protect security wise so those users even me you know I can make an accidental click but you have to have an elevated privilege to be able to run the program that is malicious to create the problem and that's where the EDR and the antivirus and all this stuff takes takes place but yeah it's it's no joke um, I, I just Commissioner Catlett just emailed me the other day and said he was he was in a pinch and needed five hundred dollars if I could change his bank account. <laughs> he sent me that too, Gary. Yeah. I gave him the five hundred bucks. I felt bad for him. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a, it's scary. Uh, you just you just need to be cautious, and if it doesn't make sense, you know, if there's any question about it, you know, reach out and have a conversation. Stay, don't reply. Uh, use another means and say, hey, I got this weird thing from you. Know, it did it did help that it came from at lazy blue eyed blonde at gmail.com. I kind of knew it wasn't him, but anyway, uh, I, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Another question for you. I, this kind of thing scares me just because of what I do. I mean, the, the terror of getting, you know, almost to the end of a manuscript and then having somebody hold it ransom right. is, is kind of scary. Right. So I don't save anything to my computer. I always send something, put it to an outside drive, like a thumb drive or something else. Does that kind of protect it? Does that keep it from getting snatched up? The fact that no, it's not sir. physically on the it, computer? It, it does not. It does not. The second that the second that it touches the computer where the the malware would be, it, it doesn't matter that it's on that. If that computer can touch it and has the rights to actually change it, John, then it no, it matters not. And one of the one of the biggest scares for a large enterprise or a large industry is, you know, is your your backups, right? Your the place where you keep things safe. And now these people have gotten so good where they can actually, you know, you call it air gap, where you separate it and it comes away because you try to protect that. Uh, they've got methods now where they bury timed explosions into these areas where you've got them backed up. And the next time they get power or the next time you connect it to your computer, it locks it up. Well, that wasn't a very nice answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Gary, let me shift gears quickly. Uh, understand last Thursday you had kind of a unique visitor at the county council. Last Thursday, we did. Yeah. We did. We, we had Raya, uh, the oh, Raya sunshine, sunshine the, yeah. the new the new animal assigned to Judge Redding, and she's a wonderful dog, and she. Uh, she, she's a blessing in the courtroom. While I'm not there much, you well can imagine some of the things that young folks are involved in, and they go in there and seeing and speaking of things that may have happened or may not, and they got this nice little labra, lab poodle mix, and she's a sweetheart. You think one of your dogs could serve the same purpose, Gary? <laughs> well, you know, if Titus were still real, <laughs> I'm not sure he would have worked, but Nash, he doesn't care. He'd have done it, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Big dogs, big dogs. You know, one of the big concerns we've talked about on the show before, some of these deep fakes that, that, that are happening with, uh, with artificial intelligence. Right. I, uh, last night on Netflix, I, I watched a show, it's called Dirty Pop, which is uh, about Lou Pearlman, who built the boy bands in, in the 90s and then ultimately mm -hmm. died in prison because of, of uh, uh, Ponzi scheme issues. The narrator for this is Lou Pearlman, who's dead. But what they've done is they've animated, there, there's a video of him from, got, you know, he shot a lot of videos of, of himself, but they've taken the words from his book and through mm. AI, they've got this video of him speaking his words from his book in his voice as if he's narrating this video. And it's enormously convincing that he's doing. Now they own up to it in, in the credits that this is what they're doing. But if they didn't own up to it, it you wouldn't know. Uh, and that's, that's really scary. It is, it is in, in, in the, you know, in the, the national election forums and all of the stuff you get, you know, you used to think conversation was, you know, was the, the tell all beat all. You should get them on the phone to talk to them. And now, I mean, you could get a personalized message and it sounds just like my dad who's been going for multi years. That's crazy, John. I, it, it makes me scratch my head. Gary, last couple of minutes here. Let's talk about the county finances. Uh, you're in a new government year now, correct? We are. We started the new fiscal year, July 1. All right. And looking forward over the next 12 months, what do you make of your financial situation? Uh, 
the the county commission, Rob, is it continues to do a great job being frugal and prudent with their expenses. We we met we landed the year with a uh, about a 4.2 million dollar uh, residual left over from last year. The commission applied three of that to open construction projects so we can finish up. We've got an expansion for a new judge. Uh, we're finishing up the Dunn Building and the Day Report Center. So we had about $840,000 uh, that they put into their contingency, contingency account. Gary, is, is any of that an unfunded mandate uh, placed on the county by the state? It, it was. Um, it A million dollars of it to do a, an expansion for a new circuit judge and to do a little bit of remodeling for a magistrate. Um, the court said, hey, you're getting these three new judges January 1, 2025, get ready for them. With, without so, financial support? 100% without financial support, all on the backs of the county commission. Now, that's two magistrates and one circuit. Is that right, Gary? No, sir. That's a circuit, a magistrate, and a family court judge. Okay. I thought that judicial positions were funded out of the court budget from the state Supreme Court, and I guess this is not the case? Their salaries, they're paid from the Supreme Court. However, their accommodations... Uh, the the 150,000 square foot judicial center uh, minus the the circuit clerk and the prosecuting attorney those are all state employees there. The county commission pays for all of it. When do you anticipate you'll start work? Is it the Crawford Building or the Berkeley Building? In, the the this temporary space is in the old jail on Raleigh Street, right out front. Of last was uh, Citibank, yes. City National. Uh, that's where the temporary courtroom space for the new judge will be and then sometime in 2028 29 or 2030 uh, I, I wholly believe that the county commission will embark on the 20 million dollar upgrade to the crawford building crawford. and well, then that will that will be the permanent space for the the magistrates okay that was my next question so you answered that nice uh, of the surplus money that you had did any of that get committed to a rainy day fund gary so eight hundred, about eight hundred and forty thousand was put in contingency, Rob, and I wholeheartedly believe that the commission will move some of that to the rainy day fund uh, once we get into the the fiscal year. Just let things move a little bit. All right, very good. Uh, any final questions for Gary from the rest of the panel here, including those of you elevated to a higher position? I already <laughs> made John mad. He doesn't. He, you know, we, we we scared him. He's going to disconnect completely. Well, I'm just trying to figure out what the options are. I guess there are none. Yeah, Typewriter. Yeah, yeah but honestly. There you go. Yeah. Gary, thanks so much for your time this morning. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, you have my nomination for Greatest Guy at the Year Award. <laughs> welcome. Have a great day, gentlemen. Thanks, Take Gary. Care. Always good talking. Can't tell you how much I appreciate that. 8.30 and our uh, break with Financial Phil on the way next. Coming up.